I started meditating about 30 years ago. I learned my first meditation techniques from my first martial arts teacher. So the single point in mind meditation technique is a very powerful concentration technique for meditation. And it involves concentrating on particular chakras. And the chakras are energy centers in our energy body. Not only do you develop concentration and the ability to hold your mind still, but once you become adept at this particular meditation technique on the chakras, you can raise the kundalini energy. And the kundalini energy is a very powerful energy of transformation. Oh man, I just took a freezing cold shower. Anybody into cold water therapy? Uh, I first came across cold showers through the Wim Hof method. If you haven't heard of Wim Hof, he is a really cool cat that has established numerous Guinness Book World Records for things like um, climbing to the top of Mount Everest in just wearing shorts, um, you know, being submerged in ice uh, for long periods of time. He originally was a seeker of spirituality um, and one day decided to take a plunge in a cold, uh, in a cold lake. And he said that the cold became his teacher, which is a very interesting concept. <clears throat> and through being submerged into the cold water, Wim Hof developed a certain breathing technique, which oxygenates the body to a very high degree. And he's now, um, and you know, through the oxygenation of the body, was able to withstand very, very cold temperatures. Now, <clears throat> without getting too far off in, into Wim Hof, I definitely recommend checking out Wim Hof. It's W-I-M-H-O-F-F, -F, Wim Hof. And he's got basically just two parts to his method. Number one is the breathing. He recommends a certain breathing technique. The breathing technique is uh, it's basically a series of rapid breathing methods. It's basically an inhalation and exhalation that looks kind of like this. It's almost like hyperventilating. But even just taking those five or six breaths just now, I already feel a, a, a change. So this breathing method can actually change the body chemistry into a more alkaline, um, you know, the body chemistry, the pH balance can either be alkaline or it can be acidic. And we want it to be more alkaline because the acidic pH balance is uh, the harbinger of disease, whereas the alkaline pH balance of the body is um, uh, wards off disease. Um, for example, cancer cannot thrive in an alkaline environment. And the alkaline or alkaline environment can also be uh, promoted by the foods that you eat. So if you go online, there's a certain, uh, there's many different charts available in an image form that shows the different alkalinity or acidity of certain foods. So it'll have a group of foods, say on this category, which is acidic, um, from just mildly acidic all the way to uh, highly acidic. And then it'll show a group of foods on this side that it's mildly alkaline and very alkaline. Um, and it makes sense. The highly alkaline foods are the raw vegetables, the greens, stuff like raw spinach, cucumber, certain berries, uh, fruits, and vegetables will promote alkalinity within the body, which has a host <clears throat> of health benefits besides just... Um, 
you know, uh, uh, preventing disease um, has a whole host of health benefits that I definitely recommend checking out. Whereas on the acidic side of the food chart, you have things like, you know, meat, coffee, um, things that uh, promote acidity, an acidic environment, an, an acidic pH balance within the body, um, those usually are bad for our health. Um, so, and then you have like right in the center is water, for example. Water is a neutral pH balance. Which is why you have the advent of all these alkaline waters. They typically add, um, I think it's certain minerals to make it more alkaline. And, um, yeah, something like uh, bicarbonate um, baking soda. If you add it to water, you can increase your body's alkalinity, which would help buffer lactic acid, which is the buildup of a certain waste product in the muscle that usually is what makes us sore after a workout. So, we've got some people on now. I think it's time to officially kick this thing off. And how do we kick it off? It's day 17 of the 30s. <laughs> Let's try that again. Of course, we have to kick it off with the bell. And here we go. We're going to make a loud bell this time. So, welcome, folks. It's day 16 of the 30 days to raise your frequency. And what's this all about? Well, my name is Rob Zaremba. If you're new to the group or new to the live stream, what we're doing here is a 30-day meditation challenge. This group began back in 2016. Uh, I started it out as a 30-day meditation challenge group. And for reasons to share and inspire people to meditate, to motivate people to meditate, because from my experience of over 30 years of being a student of meditation, I have um, realized that it really takes a daily practice to get good at meditation, to get better at meditation. And it makes sense. Just like anything in life, you want to be consistent and you want to dedicate regular practice to a skill, an art, um, you know, uh, something that you're doing in life, a hobby, to get better at it. And meditation is no different. So. What we're doing here is 30 days to raise your frequency because with an elevated frequency, we have the ability to repel any type of negative influences, any type of negative energy or any type of lower frequency energy that might be pervading the ethers these days. Um, and so the idea is that meditation helps to raise your frequency, but it's certain kinds of meditation that would help to aid and raise your frequency better than others. And this is why I put out the message for you guys today that are you bored with your meditation? Because chances are, if you're bored with your meditation, you're not going to do it every day, right? You're not going to be consistent. You're going to maybe try it. And if you get bored with something, you're not going to be uh, interested in doing it on a regular basis. And that's going to be... Um, the reason why you don't progress in your meditation practice. So, in my opinion, meditation should not be boring. And uh, meditation should be fun. It should be exciting. It should be something that is, uh, you know, um, something that uh, it's fun to do. And talking about meditation should not be um, something that's uh, dry and dull. So, I first started meditating when I was young. Um, I was 15 years old. I started martial arts training and I was fortunate enough to have a teacher in my Kung Fu school that taught meditation. And so I learned my first meditation from him which was certain breathing techniques. And it was a few years later when I was about aged 18 that I came across an enlightened teacher, a meditation master. And the technique that I'm about to share with you today comes from my enlightened teacher. And if you ever want to research who this gentleman is, it's uh, Dr. Frederick Lenz, and he went by the name Rama. Rama was an extraordinary being. Um, you know, started out as a university professor, 
uh, wrote some books, was a spiritual seeker himself, had many teachers, you know, meditated since he was young, and then around um, his late 20s, I believe it was, you know, he became enlightened. Now, you don't just become enlightened. Usually someone who is enlightened, and it's obviously a rare thing, <clears throat> Uh, enlightenment is something that usually comes from past lives. And what does past lives have to do with it? Well, generally, it takes many, 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 many lifetimes to even become interested in meditation. And if you're not really a believer in reincarnation, I hope I don't lose you right here. Um, just take it on faith for now that meditation could be something that possibly, or that reincarnation could be something that possibly exists. Uh, for me, it answered a lot of questions about, you know, life, and reincarnation seemed to make the most sense to me. And it's obviously part of the Buddhist tenets, uh, the understanding uh, that meditation, or that, <laughs> that reincarnation, rather, excuse me, is just the way of things. Life is a cycle. Anyway, <clears throat> Rama, my teacher, had been enlightened in many, many past lives, and He's uh, uh, been a teacher of enlightenment and meditation in many, many past lives. So when he uh, regained his enlightenment in this life, um, it was sort of inevitable. But obviously, to regain enlightenment, one has to look around at the world and say, well, this isn't necessarily something that's um, giving me all the answers, and so I'm going to seek something like meditation, something like spirituality, something like self discovery because I'm just not satisfied with what the world has shown me. I'm not satisfied with what I'm seeing from the people around me. They kind of have a uh, surface understanding of life and when you probe deeper and ask the deeper questions of well what is this and how do you explain this, most people just don't know or they simply reiterate or regurgitate some information that they either read in a book or that someone told them. So, that's who I learned this technique from, which we're about to do momentarily. So, I'm going to take you on a guided meditation today. What this meditation technique is, is based on a single-pointed mind concentration, which simply means that you focus on one object at a time, to the exclusion of all else. Now, sounds easy on paper, but you'll find out momentarily that it can be challenging. And this is the fun part about the meditation. This is why this technique is far from boring because we absolutely have within our means through this technique a way of really challenging ourselves. Because in order to hold your mind on a single point to the exclusion of all else without being distracted, well, you'll find out momentarily how fun it can be. And when I say it's fun, you know, it is fun because... If you're someone who's uh, uh, interested in meditation, then chances are that you're seeking development, spiritual development, personal development, you're on a pathway of self-discovery, and you're looking for something that's going to take you to the next level. And if you've been around a little while, you know that anything that's going to take you to the next level requires a certain amount of work, requires a certain amount of effort. Nothing in life is obtained without a certain degree of practice, without a certain degree of steadfast, concentrated effort. And so when we put forth a little bit of effort in this particular technique, it's quite fun and it's quite challenging because to hold your mind on a single point for long periods of time, as you'll find out, makes us aware of something very interesting about ourselves. And what's very interesting is that our mind is a mess. Our mind is scattered. It's wandering from here to there. Now when I say the mind, I'm talking about our attention, our awareness. For the average person, our attention is undisciplined. Unless you've been um, in a career, a technical career like computer science, programming, engineering, architecture, mathematics, um, uh, perhaps uh, music as a professional musician, then perhaps the concentration ability, the ability to focus on one thing or focus on many things at one time has not yet been developed. So for some, this meditation practice can be a little bit challenging, but I can guarantee you with just a little bit of practice 
that you get better and you get better fairly quickly in a few days, in a few weeks. You should start noticing some proficiency at this technique. And I'm one of those guys that is a firm believer that you should stick with one technique, at least for a while, and gain a certain amount of proficiency from it. You know, I am... Uh, I don't like the type of meditation challenges that offer a new meditation for you every single day. I don't think that that's going to help much for uh, the beginner or the early practitioner of meditation. I think it's helpful to master a certain technique. Stick to one technique, get good at it, and then start to play around with techniques. Now the cool thing about this technique is that there's really five techniques in one. Let me explain. So I discussed the single pointed mind. It's the ability to hold your attention on one point to the exclusion of all else, meaning when the mind wanders, and yes, it will have a tendency to wander, this is simply just due to the habit of the mind because we've allowed the mind, the attention, we have allowed our awareness to just roam and become scattered because we haven't put it in any sort of discipline. So when we take the mind and we hold it at a certain point, you will notice that the mind will tend to wander. Well, all we simply have to do is bring it back to the point of focus. Every single time the mind wanders, we bring it back to the point of focus. Now, you may bring it back to the point of focus and notice that it wanders a second later. That's okay, it's completely normal. The idea is to try to hold it, try to hold your attention on a single point for as long as you can. Now, guess what? The cool thing about this is that it develops a degree of willpower, an internal power that actually translates into all other aspects of your life. So you should come away from one meditation session noticing something different about your perception, about your awareness. So in the five steps to stillness technique, we utilize the single pointed mind concentration technique. So let me go over the steps briefly and then we'll jump right into this meditation. Sound good? Step one, I like to focus on a yantra. What we do with the yantra is we use our eyes, which are, which is our predominant uh, and dominant sense. And we're very good at looking at things. So what we do is we simply look at the dot with our eyes and in the dot, around that tiny circle, there's a little dot. What I like to do is to look at that dot and keep it in my gaze, steadfast, with a laser-like focus as if my eyes and my vision were a heat-seeking missile and that central dot is the target and it sticks there no matter what, it follows it no matter what. And here's what's gonna happen, well your eyes will wander, you'll start to move your attention back to your thoughts, you might get distracted by some sounds, you might get distracted by some bodily sensations. This is totally normal just ignore all that and bring your eyes right back to the focus. The reason why we start with an open-eyed gazing meditation for step one is that it's pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy to look at an object and hold it within our gaze. So that's step one. What that does is it warms up our concentration ability. It takes us from our current mind state, which might be scattered and wandering or thinking about a lot of thoughts and it hones it. It brings it to a visual point which should be about two to three feet in front of your eyes. I like to tape it on the wall right here in front of me. I'll show you guys real quick here. Yeah, you can see it taped on the wall. Now, before that, I personally like to sit in a chair when I meditate. As you can see my chair, I like to sit on the edge of a chair with my back straight. It's important to have a good posture while you meditate. When you notice yourself slouching a little bit, just readjust your posture. This is important for two reasons. First of all, to increase our frequency, we want to make sure that our posture is at its best. Because form translates to frequency. So what do I mean by that? Well, you could have some kind of a form like, for example, if I just drew a shape. 
and this shape has a certain frequency, right? Or if I drew another shape. Notice the difference between the frequency emitted by a triangle and just a blob. Okay, so the triangle has excellent geometry. Of course, I tried to make it as perfect as I could, but you get the idea that there does exist perfection in form. Look at geometry. Look at an equilateral triangle. Look at a perfect square. These are great examples of perfection. Perfection does exist, my friend. And of course, we want to come as close to perfection of the technique, perfection of the posture. Holding a perfect posture simply means keeping the spine straight, keeping the head up. And what this does is it creates a higher frequency versus slouching. Okay, so the other part of that is that in order to get the proper energetic flow during the meditation, we want to keep our posture in a good posture. Why is this? Okay, so when we move to step two, step three, and step four, we're focusing on these areas of the body. And these areas of the body correspond to areas in the energy body called chakras. There's seven primary chakras in our energy body. Our energy body is a body of energy that surrounds our physical body. And when we focus on the chakras in an ascending manner, as we'll be doing momentarily here in the meditation, what happens is there's a certain energy that rises up to the top. And the goal is to bring this energy up to the highest point. And the highest point in this meditation will be the third eye chakra where I'm placing my finger right here. Now again, the chakras are not in the physical body, but they correspond generally around the areas that we'll be pointing to. So with step two, we're focusing on what's called the navel chakra. With step three, we're focusing on the heart chakra. And with step four, we're focusing on the third eye chakra. And the reason why we do this in this particular manner is because there's a force. There's an energy called Kundalini. Kundalini resides or lies dormant in what's called the root chakra, which is, at, which is around the base of the spine in the energy body. And this root chakra, it contains a latent form of this kundalini. When we focus on the chakras above it, what happens is when we, when we bring our attention to the navel, the kundalini will rise up to the navel. It will awaken from its dormant state and rise up and become active. And it will rise up to the point to where you're focusing and concentrating. Now, to the degree that you can hold your attention on the chakra and feel it, feel the energy there, to the, to the degree that you can do that without distraction will be the degree that the, kundal, that the kundalini will rise. In other words, if your mind is scattered and it's difficult to focus and it's not quite sharp, you're not quite holding it on the chakra, which is perfectly normal for the, for the beginner for the first few times, chances are you're not going to get much kundalini arousal. So as we move up to step three, we'll focus on the heart chakra. And again, similar type of process. We're going to be feeling the energy around the chakra, around this area. We'll point to it with our finger. And if we can hold our attention there and really feel the spot where we hold our attention, energy will collect. And the energy from our attention, just holding still and feeling that point to the exclusion of all else, energy will rise up to that point. The Kundalini will rise up to that point. And then we move up to the third eye chakra, which is step four. And we move up to the third eye, the energy may rise up into the head. And at this point, you might see light. At this point, you'll become very still. This is why it's called the five steps to stillness, because we're progressively entering into more and more stillness. We're getting more and more still within this technique. So up to the step four, we're concentrating, we're focusing. Then we move into step five. Step five is a process of letting go. Step five is a process of surrender. So in step five, 
We're not focusing on anything. We're not concentrating any longer. Step five is really the beginning of meditation. Meditation really is a step above concentration. When you can concentrate on one point for a prolonged period of time, you're actually entering into a state of meditation where there's no thought. Meditation is just a state of being where the mind is quiet, you're in a state of stillness. So in step five, it's just a complete surrender of any kind of control of the mind, any kind of focus, you're letting go of all that. You're releasing any type of contracted energy, you're releasing any type of tension. So ideally, the step five is a state of non-doing. We don't necessarily seek to do anything which can be quite difficult at first because you'll notice that your attention wants to do something. It wants to hold in the eyes, even though the eyes are closed. It wants to hear, it wants to move, it wants to be held in the frontal part of our perception because this is simply a tendency of our attention. So what this meditation technique is designed to do is to break us out of our tendencies of attention. These tendencies of attention are our attachments. And remember, we all know, attachments equal suffering. When we're attached to something and that something goes away, then we're unhappy, then we suffer. So attachment is what causes suffering. And this is one of the tenets of Buddhism. So, why are we in a state of unhappiness if our attention is attached to the senses? Because this is a state, if our attention is attached to any sense, it's a state of limitation. Our attention should be free. We are multi-dimensional beings, meaning we're just we're more than just the physical body. But we have these five physical senses that we're typically using predominantly. You know, our attention shifts from the senses to thoughts, to the senses, to thoughts, to images. And in meditation, what we seek to do is move beyond the physical body into what I call the sixth sense. And the sixth sense is related to your intuition. It's related to your psychic ability. And this ability to feel the chakra is actually a sixth sense. It's beyond the five senses. You're actually feeling that energy. Okay, so, you guys ready to do this? And, let me pull up my music. Normally, uh, we meditate to silence. But for the 30 days to raise your frequency meditation challenge, I'm using music to meditate to because it makes it a little bit easier to follow along for everyone to meditate to music. So, let me pull up my album. I've downloaded five songs for the five steps. One song per step. And this music can be found at the top of the group in the announcements section. You'll find two announcements. Announcement number one has the Sri Yantra. The Yantra, you can print it out um, and put it up on your wall. If you're watching this video later, go ahead and pause. Print out that Yantra. Hang it up on your wall. If you're seated in a chair like me, you can have it on your wall about two to three feet away from you around eye level. If you're seated on the ground, on a cushion, cross-legged, then you can kind of put it on a little table in front of you about eye level. Maybe put some books behind it so you can kind of just lay the yantra on it. Or if you have like a little stand and a frame, you can kind of put it on there. Okay? So, you guys ready to do this? Here we go. Let's begin by taking a few deep breaths. In the nose and out the mouth. First, exhale all the air. We want to make sure that we clear out our nasal passages. <sighs> A 
And don't worry if you feel a little bit of nasal congestion or if you have a difficult time breathing in this manner. Usually when you start to meditate, especially on the heart chakra, you'll begin to notice that nasal congestion may dissipate, it may open up. So beginning with step one, sit up straight. Good posture. We have our yantras before us. Begin by focusing the eyes on that central dot. If you've done this before, you know what to do. If you're new to this practice, simply gaze at that center dot. If you don't have a yantra, you can just gaze at the video for step one or listen to the music. What we're doing here is seeking to warm up our single pointed concentration ability. By focusing on that central dot with our eyes, we're going to forget about everything else. Forget about what you need to do later. Forget about yourself for a while. And just focus on that center dot. If thoughts or distractions come in and out of the mind, just ignore them and gaze at that dot. Breathe naturally throughout the entire meditation. to step two. Close the eyes gently. With the eyes closed, place the tips of your finger about an inch below your belly button. Press gently into that area. This is the area of the navel chakra. Feel the slight pressure of the finger pushing on that area. This gives your attention a point to move to and hold at. Again, breathe naturally throughout the entire meditation. What we want to do is feel the spot. Use your ability to feel the energy, the sensation. When you're ready, remove the finger. 
Continue to feel the spot around the navel chakra. When thoughts come in and out of the mind, just ignore them and try to hold your attention on feeling the navel for as long as you can. Step three, move your attention now to the heart chakra in the center of the chest. Gently place the fingertips in the center of the chest and press lightly. The heart chakra is the chakra of love. Try to feel loving energy around your heart chakra area. Once your attention has locked on and you can feel that spot, remove the fingers, keep a good posture, and hold your attention on feeling the energy around the heart chakra. Imagine if this were the last meditation ever. What kind of intensity would you put into it?
Now move your attention up to the third eye between your eyebrows and about an inch above. Gently place a finger, touch the forehead. Feel the pressure of the finger and the forehead. Lock on to that feeling. Remain calm but keep alert and a steady focus on the third eye chakra. Remove the finger when ready and hold your attention on feeling that spot. Hold still. Step five, release all concentration and control. Remove any particular focus. Simply allow yourself to dissolve. Consciousness is already here. Just get out of the way.
slowly return back to your body. Open and close the eyes. Awesome. Well, thanks for hanging in there, folks. I hope you enjoyed the meditation today. This meditation technique works. It may take a few tries, but once you get a sense of the process, you might like it. All right. So thanks again for watching and joining in for the meditation today. If you have any questions, just feel free to drop a comment below. In the comment section, I will leave a free downloadable PDF guide to the five steps to stillness meditation. Just a quick start guide to kind of remind you about what each step entails. And if you'd like further instruction, in a few weeks, maybe two weeks or so, I'll be offering a private group, group coaching program. The private group coaching program is uh, a monthly membership, $30 a month. I call it Concentration to Consciousness. And we'll learn this technique more in depth. We'll take it to the next level. I'll show you how to meditate to silence with this technique, which may actually be easier for you uh, because some people in um, in the beginning might be distracted by the music. Uh, the music kind of creates a nice little backdrop and a way to time each step. But when I typically do this meditation on my own, I do it to the Insight Timer app, which allows you to program a certain length. Let's say you're doing 25 minute meditation. Well, you can set up a little bell to ring every five minutes to prompt you to the next step. So you can essentially do the meditation in silence, which allows for a deeper, undistracted concentration experience. All right, my friends, so thank you so much again. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.